Good morning. Okay, let me try it again. All right, good morning. Okay, y'all, y'all are there. Oh, so sorry about that. Uh, we're starting a new series called Simplify, and a uh, good time to do it at the first of the year. How many people would say, you know what, that's part of the problem is I really do need to simplify. Life has become so complicated. Anybody there? Okay, you're numb. Okay, I understand. It's the first of the year. You're not exactly sure what's going on. Well, it, it is true. Uh, that life becomes very complicated. There are things to do. But, you know, the real complication of it is that we look at life and we try to figure out what's really going to bring satisfaction. What's really going to be happy, you know, make me happy. What what should I be, uh, you know, pouring myself into? What should I be applying to my life? How how am I going to get everything sorted out so I find what I'm really looking for and what's uh, really important. And when I think of simplify, I don't think necessarily of just having less stuff or doing less stuff in your life. I always think about, you know, what's the most important thing? What should I really be focused on? What should I look to and say, that's what I should make sure is the priority in my life. And these other things that are part of life, they're just not that important in trying to divide them out and separate them. You know, one of the things that you will notice, uh, it is in the first statement in your outline, one of the things that you will notice is Jesus was incredibly um, gifted and capable, for some reason, I think it'll pop up on the screen, and uh, ha- he had this ability to look at things and to simplify them and to prioritize them and to say, this is what's important, this is what's not. Uh, He just brought a real clarity to almost every situation, every circumstance in life. In fact, it's one of the reasons that uh, he had these followers who went with him because he was able to bring that in life and uh, change their life totally for the rest of their lives. Uh, how they would live, what they would do, uh, where they would apply themselves. And uh, if you look at it, you say, man, that would be really, really attractive if someone, you know, could do that, could help me sort of sort through some things. And so this is what I want to do this morning as we start this. Um, let you know, there are uh, simplified books. Bill Heibel uh, wrote those books uh, this past year, and they're out there, and, and we're going to be reading through those books over the next uh, four to six weeks. I think there are about eight chapters in there, and uh, we have some simplified groups that you can become a part of. So this is one of those uh, things and one of those times that we, we do this sort of as a, as a church as a whole in all the services and, the, and all the small groups just to, uh, so we're sort of on the same page for the beginning of the year. I, I like doing this. I like uh, this kind of time. That's why you're having to do it. I, so, okay. No, it's, it's a good thing for us to do. But let me take you to this passage. This is where Jesus is uh, uh, speaking or talking with a family that he was uh, good friends with. And uh, the family is known uh, by the three main characters in it, uh, Martha, Mary, and they had a, a brother. You remember Martha and Mary's brother? His name was what? That's right, Larry. Larry was the, uh, Lazarus, I'm sorry, Lazarus was the uh, brother. And uh, they actually lived in a little place, a town called Bethany. And if you were to look at the uh, Mediterranean, you, know, you got the Mediterranean Sea, and over here is Jerusalem you know, sitting uh, just east of the Mediterranean Sea. And then about two miles east of that is the town of Bethany. And so it was on the way, it was very convenient, uh, you know, whenever they had to go to Jerusalem, and and Jesus often spent time uh, with them there. And here's how the story picks up in Luke. This is how Luke records it. It says, as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, uh, he came to a village where a woman named Martha, I want you to catch this, she opened her home to him. This means Martha knew him well. Uh, One of the translations, I think New Living says that uh, Martha welcomed them into her home, welcomed Jesus and the disciples. So they were good friends, and it's an illustration for me and you to understand this. Martha was a believer. Martha knew Jesus. Many times in this story, uh, Martha becomes the uh, villainess in this story, you know, because of the way she did things, as if the answer was, you know, Martha needed to become a real Christian. That, that's not the case at all. Martha knew Jesus very well. She was, she was very close to him, closely uh, related. And, and the reason I say that is because sometimes this is what people do in situations like this, stories like this. That Jesus is the answer to everything. And I know you're going to think, so you're saying he's not? You're a preacher? He is and yet he's not. It doesn't mean, it's not so simple that you just say, you know, so I'm at the restaurant, you know, what do you want as your side orders? Jesus. You know, it's, it doesn't work that way, right? 
You know, he, 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 he is the main character in our life. He's, he's the, you know, the part that, you know, but it doesn't mean he's, uh, Chuck Swindoll used to tell this uh, story um, years and years ago about uh, in their church in California, they had a junior high camp one time and uh, all the junior hires are there and there's a speaker there and he's trying to get them to be very real and connect with them. And he knows they're raised in church and on all this, but he's trying to deal with them. And so he says, he decides to do this illustration. He says, okay, I want y'all to tell me what I'm talking about. I'm thinking of an animal. It lives in the woods. Uh, it climbs trees. You know, it's pretty small, smaller than a chihuahua. Uh, and they're just, you know, no reaction. And, you know, it has a long kind of furry tail um, climbs trees, it collects nuts, you know. Sometimes they, you know, cartoonists make characters out of it and no reaction. And, she, he, you know, he goes on and on. Finally, a little girl raises her hand. He's, he's all excited. Yeah, yeah. He says, she says, well, it sounds like a squirrel to me, but I'll say Jesus. You know, that, that's, <laughs> that's what happens to us sometimes. You know, uh, so you're saying that, no, no. I, but you have to understand what that means. And, and how that works in life, or you just get it all out of whack. And there are people who get it all out of whack, and, and then someone says, well, I don't want to be like that. Okay, I understand. The, catch what this means. What the, Martha knew Jesus. She, she was a believer. She was a follower. And yet, Martha had her struggles, and that is exactly the point of the story. Just because you've become a Christian doesn't mean it's over or, or it's done, and now, I don't, you know, now everything is going to be rosy and perfect. It, it, it means you've, you've found the one who is your rescuer, you know. But it also means that, you know, you have to build the, the right relationship with that rescuer, you know, to be led and guided. I mean, that's the whole, the whole point of this uh, story. So, okay, I know I've over inside. This is what it says. Next part. Uh, she had a sister named Mary who sat, I want you to catch this part, sat at the Lord's feet. Look at this listening to what he said. Now, it's a contrast. Two sisters, both believers, both the same family, welcoming Jesus into their home, but there's a difference in Martha's approach and Mary's approach. Now, um, to defend Martha, it's probably a part of Martha's personality. If, if you look at who Martha was, uh, Martha was a detailed person. You know, she was one of those uh, people who got a lot of stuff done. Uh, she was a, uh, I would call her, you know, like a high achiever. Mary is probably not quite like that. I mean, in the other illustrations, uh, that, that seems to be the case. And a lot of times we look at the high achiever, the one who gets everything done, and says, that's, that's the way it's supposed to be. You know, that's the way life is supposed to be. Uh, you're supposed to be doing those things. In fact, Martha is doing in her culture, what is expected of her, she's taking care of the details, all of the preparation, the meal that when these people would come. Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus, and she's listening. And I want you to think about it. Doesn't that make sense? Here's the one who's come to lead her, to guide her, the one who's come from heaven, who, who not only knows God, he is God. And, and wouldn't it make sense that you would go and you'd say, I, I'd like to know what he has to say. I'm sure he can teach me a lot of things. Even though in her culture, women didn't do that. The men sat at the feet of a teacher, but the women were supposed to be, you know, in the preparation room. They were supposed to be getting things ready. And so Martha is unhappy that Mary is not doing her role as the society, the world, the culture around her, you know, tells her that, that it's supposed to work this way. And so this is what it goes on to say. Next verse says, uh, but Martha was distracted by all the prep preparations. That meant not doing what Mary was doing, listening. She had all these details and all these distractions. And she came to him and said, Lord, listen to this. Don't you feel this way sometimes? Don't you what? Don't you care? I'm, I'm having to do all the work. I'm taking care of all the details. Why don't you tell Mary to get up, you know, and to get in there and help your, your, your sister the way you're supposed to, to do all the details. And, and Martha is taking offense at it. She's like, you know, do you, do you not really care that I have to do all these things by myself? Do you not really care that I'm doing what I should be doing, what I am supposed to be doing? Any high achievers here this morning? I'm, I'm not talking about that you, you know, you say I've got, I mean, that's the way you're wired. You, you, you're always looking to the next thing and you're, you're pushing. High achievers usually are very detail-oriented. 
In fact, the problem with being a high achiever and detail-oriented is no matter how much you accomplish, never enough. <laughs> what, is, what is the next thing? I, I know, I have some like that, you know. I, I always tell people I have, you know, two kids and I have a, a high achiever and I have a high liver, you know. So I don't mean this kind of liver. I mean, you know, one that, you know, looked at it as what should be done next what, and, and is very good at it. My daughter, Jamie, incredibly gifted at the details and getting things done. In fact, with, with all of her grades and everything, people would say to her, man, you're so smart. And she would always say, she'll still tell you this, she said, I'm not that smart, I just know how to study. You know what she means? I know how to achieve. I, I, can, I can sort it all out, I can accomplish, and she can, I can accomplish two or three times as much as most people can in the same amount of time, get it all done, and, and that's how she's wired, that's how she's, that's how she's motivated. You know, the mistake, though, that people make is they look at someone like that and say they've got it all together. Man, they're, they, you know, they, they understand life, they're, you know, they're so confident, and, and, and she would say, I appear to be that way. You know, and, you know, and then they look at the high liver and say, you know, you don't get anything done. But she would always say, you know, I envy my brother because he really enjoys life. He enjoys relationships. Her brother would say, I envy my sister because she gets so much done. It, we're wired differently. And Martha is probably the high achiever. Mary is probably the high liver in this story. But Jesus is not talking about you should be wired a certain way. He's trying to say it, no matter how you're wired, you need to understand what's most important. And the high achiever has a tendency to say all the details are the most important thing. All the details are the most important thing. And tell a story of my daughter because I love using other people as an illustration instead of my own struggles. <laughs> Just works better that way, right? So, um, so she went to the uh, Naval Academy, uh, which I was uh, very proud of. She did, she did very well. She graduated ninth in her class. Uh, she was the top female in the class. She, had a, she got a lot of awards. We got to sit at a special place in the front because of her at graduation. I'm just going to tell you, you know, I, I, absolutely proud of that and all too. But, but I also want you to understand that how, how the, all this works. She does all this stuff. You know, she gets all these awards and all this, all, this, all this stuff. And at the same time, it doesn't mean that you got everything figured out. In fact, it can be an illusion. You can be fooled and tricked by it. And she would tell you, I'm not telling you, you know, something that, that she wouldn't say, she would tell you the same thing. So this is what happens. She graduates, uh, she's done, and, and they assign her. Um, that she got offered several scholarships. She turned them down because she's fallen in love. She's going to get married, go to San Diego, uh, work on a ship. And then she, I said, well, why don't you ask them, what if I can go to graduate school there? She said, Dad, it doesn't work that way. The government says, here's we offered you, turn them down. You know, that's off the table. I said, well, you can at least try. She did. They actually said, okay, we'll give you a, a scholarship, and you can go right there to school. And then she had to work on in-state tuition and all that in California. So she's working on all this. In the meantime, before she goes there, they assign her a job in Annapolis in Maryland on campus for the summer until she goes and takes her assignment. And at first they assigned her to sailboats. So all the freshmen coming in, you know, she's teaching them how to sail. She told them, she said, that's great except for one thing, I don't know how to sail. And they're like, how can you graduate from the Naval and you don't know how to sail? She said, you know, when my freshman year was there and you learned how to sail, all the boys wanted to do it, I let them, you know. So she said, I just, you know, enjoyed the trip, you know, sunbathing on the deck and let them do all the work. And so, you know, she took her role very well. She said they all wanted to do it and show what they could do. I let them do it, you know. So, uh, so uh, they instead assigned her to the basketball team. Now, my daughter is five feet tall. She weighs 105 pounds. So I would always call her and pick at her and I'd say, so have you been teaching them how to dunk? You know, because they're all, you know, all the coaches during the summer are off recruiting. She's running the girls' basketball team at the Naval Academy. She decides she needs to go get a, a lunchbox and she can take her lunch because she's very efficient. She gets everything done, uses her time well. And I get a phone call one day during the summer. She says, I pull over to the side of the road, and Dad, I've just finished slamming my fist against the steering wheel. I said, okay, so what's going on? And I knew she was under a lot of pressure, you know, about getting married, where you're going to grad school. I mean, a lot of decisions to be made. And are these the right decisions? So I said, so what's going on? She said, well, here, you know, I pull into Target, <clears throat> get a uh, lunchbox. I turn too soon, which she always had a tendency to do. I hit the curb with the car. You know, I went in and I stood in front of the lunchboxes in Target for 45 minutes and could not pick one. You ever been there before? Anything like that? 
And, 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 and this is what dads are supposed to do. Because she's, you know, she always, always say, Dad, just tell me what to do. I say, you know, I can't do that. Uh, I can help kind of guide you, but I can't tell you what to do. Here's, here's what she's doing, and this is what I had to help her understand. It's not about the lunchbox. It's about you have these major decisions, and you're trying to make the right decision. And this is what, this is what uh, when people get caught up in the details, the small stuff, this is what they do. They think, you've done this too, they think, I, I know I have, if I get all of the small details right, the big things will, that's right, the big things will take care of themselves and fall into place. Does it work that way? It's backwards, isn't it? It's the opposite. You get the big things right. You say, this is what's most important. Then the details, the small things fall into place. They find that the things that are, are not going to matter anyway. They're not as big a deal. In fact, I told her, I have, you know, I, I've always do a little bit of humor. I said, you know, here's the deal. Go back and work on your in-state tuition. It was worth about six or $8,000 in her pocket. I said, so get that. You get that taken care of. Then you walk back into Target and you say, you know, I'll take all of them. Just, you know, <laughs> load them in. The, I just got a check. Load them in the car. I'll take every lunch box you've got, you know. So uh, I still call Kyle, her husband, I still call him her lunchbox because that's what she was trying to figure out. You know, what, what are the major decisions? What, you know, what should I be doing with my life? What is the most important thing with my life? In fact, I'll, I'll tell you this, at her graduation, I took her around. Uh, we went around the campus because I wanted to, you know, look at some things and I knew that she had her name on some plaques at the campus because of her achievements, which is really, you know, cool. And, and, and at the time, her last name is still Bradley, my name. So my name is on the plaque, you know, except for the, you know, <laughs> So, which is cool because it's the only way my name is ever going to get on a plaque for achievement, you know, unless I go spray paint it myself. And then that's not really wise because then they know who did it, you know. So anyway, you know, that's, that's the only way I would have got it. But she, she has her name. On it. So I went in there. We're looking, you know, in the buildings, and there's her name up there. And this is what I did to her. I, I'm really bad about these things. I said, you know, here's the problem. In two weeks, no one will care. In two weeks, no one will remember. You're just another name on a plaque. Because they're, wor- they're moving on to the next, next class, the next ones who are going to get their names on the pie. Who's, you know, competing for it? That, that's the way it works. In fact, that's the problem with achievements when you think the achievement is going to fill me up and going to make my life, you know, feel like it was worth it or whatever. They're all small things. They're things. And listen, if you're a high liver, it's the same way with experiences and living. You can't fill your, your life up with with wonderful experiences and going doing things. You, you can't, because they come and they go. You've lived them, and, you know, and it is enriching, sure, just like the achievement. But it goes. It's, it's gone. It's, it's, not, it's a small thing in life. And if you get life mixed up and you don't get the priorities right, you don't work on the most important things, the bigger things, then what happens is you're left with the things that don't matter and things that don't last. And you don't want to be left with those things. In fact, let me give you an illustration. I'm, I'm doing this because um, a friend of mine sent me something on this. He's actually in here. And, uh, and I saw this illustration, and I have to tell you, they butchered it. And so let me do the illustration for you. Because this is like your life, right? And your life, there's a lot of details in your life. There are a lot of small things in your life. And the problem is our life just gets filled up with all of these things, and it gets overwhelming. And I just say, man, you know, and and we think, once again, if I can just get these right, man, if I can get all the details right, then the big things will just find their place. Doesn't work that way at all. You just fill your life up with details and things that don't really matter, and and, and you can't help it. I mean, they're there anyway, but, you know, that's, that's what happens. And then the big things come along, right? Like God himself. Jesus, you know, the things that are going to last forever. And the problem with them, with all those little things, is we just say, yeah, but it just doesn't fit. I I can't, you know, it is big, but, you know, in the midst of everything else, I just can't find the place for that in my life. And, And the reason is not because the fact it doesn't fit. It does, and it fits with all the details. It's just you have to make sure you understand what the priorities are. So the, the way you do that is instead of, you know, letting your life being dominated by all the details and the small things, you know, you decide, okay, I got to do a quick little, uh, 
You know, you, you pour out some of these things, at least in the sense of how you prioritize, and you say, you know what, it does fit. And the good thing about how it does fit is when I get it in there and it does fit, all the details, they find their place also, the small things, so that, you know, if the truth is if I don't get all of them in there and they don't all fit in there, it's okay. It is. Because the things that were most important, I got them. You, so you can chase every detail in the world, and you know what you'll find out? You still didn't get them all, right? I used to have a, a boss, pastor, and uh, we'd have a day off, and uh, he was absolutely a hard driver. I mean, he'd work you to death, and he would say this. He'd say, I know tomorrow's your day off, and uh, you got a chance to you know, go be with your family and all. He says, and if you have everything done that you can possibly do, everything that ne- you know, everything Every detail is taken care of. You're welcome to take your day off. Well, he did that because he knew, do you ever get everything done? Of course not. (laughs) Of course you don't. And he would do that just to mess with us and all. Of course you don't. But if you're not careful chasing every detail and everything and every little thing that in the long run doesn't really matter, if you chase and chase and chase and chase, one day you end up and you don't have the big things in your life. And you really don't have the security that you're looking for. See, when when the disciples, the people, Mary and Martha, when they got around Jesus, this is what they understood. When we we get around him, he knows what's most important. And when we get around him, there is a confidence that we have about, about life. That everything just changes because of who he is. In fact, so much so that at one point Jesus begins to talk about leaving them. He says, I've got to go. And, and honestly, all of those who knew him, they really flipped out over it. I mean, they were like, you, you can't leave. And they, they weren't doing it because of him, because of thinking of him. They were doing it thinking of who? Me, you know. I mean, you have changed everything about my life. How can you even talk about or think about leaving? They're just like, they're just like Martha, don't you care? You know. And of course Jesus did. In fact, Jesus did this. This is really important. For, for uh, me and you, he said, here's the deal, though. If I leave, uh, I'll send another. <clears throat> and uh, I love uh, the language studies. Had a Greek uh, professor who, who taught me about this uh, word for another. In the English, we have one word for another. In the Greek, there's two words for another. One means another, but not exactly the same kind. And that means if I were to say, I'm going to take your car, but don't worry, I will give you another car to drive, and I take your really nice brand new Mercedes, and I leave you an old 20-year-old Ford that barely runs. I really did give you another car, right? But you would say, yeah, this is not the same. But there's this other word, or another word for another in the Greek, that means I will give you another of exactly the same kind. And that means I'm taking your brand new Mercedes, but I'm leaving you with another brand new Mercedes, and you can't tell the difference. It is so much like it. This is the word that Jesus uses when he says, I will send you another, and he will comfort you, and he will be with you, and you will not be alone. And he's talking about the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will come, and we are not alone. We are not without him. We're not without our guidance. But unfortunately, like Martha, many times what happens to us is, we just don't bother to get around him. We've lost our priorities. You can do this. And it doesn't mean, you know, that you're not a Christian. It just means that all of a sudden, you know, there's a lot of insecurity. There are a lot of struggles. Things are more confusing. The details are overwhelming me. It, and, and, and all of a sudden, I, I reprioritize because you don't get any awards for going and sitting at the feet of Jesus, Right? You just know that this is the right place to be, and and this is the right guidance that I do. And you change, and you go back, and you say, this is what I really need. This is what I really long for. In fact, look at what this verse goes on to say this. Uh, It says, uh, Martha, Martha, uh, the Lord answered. And and he's doing this in a way, he's going to chastise her, but he's doing it in a loving way. Some translations uh, say, he said, Martha, dear Martha, because that's true. But he's he's after her also, because when you love somebody, you you make sure you you tell them the right thing. Martha, uh, Martha, you are worried and upset about what? So many details. (laughs) You, you, You got it mixed up. He said, but a few things are needed. Or indeed, only one. Mary has chosen what is what? Better. Or some translations say the best, and it will not be taken away from her. See, he's saying, but there are some things 
that last. There's some things that cannot be taken away from you because God himself will make sure that, that, that they're not. And, and Mary has chosen the better thing, the thing that's most important. Now, let me ask you this question. It is in your outline. What is that thing? Because, you know, I, I, I can remember, you know, spending so much time saying, what is he talking about? What is that one thing? What is that one thing? It's simple. It's, it, just read the story simply. It's not that complicated, but we make it complicated, right? What is that one thing? Do you know what it is? It was Jesus. Of course it was. It wasn't a squirrel. It was, it was, Je- I, you know. <laughs> it was Jesus. It was being around him. It was choosing to listen to him because he would lead her. He would guide her. Martha was so distracted by the details, she just didn't have time for that. And he said, Martha, you, but you're missing the most, the best, the most, that will not be taken away from you. But, it, you know, you, if you miss it, <laughs> but it's not that hard to do. There's an uh, article that um, a friend of mine said, it came out in the uh, Huffington Post, and I, 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 uh, the next part of your little outline, I, I'm, I'm stealing from a guy uh, named uh, Michael Mulligan who uh, wrote this uh, article. He is a, a headmaster. He's an educator in California. Uh, he teaches, or he is the headmaster of one of those uh, boarding schools where very wealthy people send their kids to prepare them for college and all that stuff too. And, uh, but he's a really, really good um, educator. And he had uh, three uh, in his article called th- The Three Questions That You Should Ask Every Teenager, because that's what he spent his life doing, is uh, working with uh, high school uh, students. Um, I-, I thought it was so good. It fits so well with this story. I'm, I'm, I'm quoting him, I'm giving the three things, uh, his wording would be a little bit different than what I would say, but I think he is right on target uh, in saying them, even though I don't know him, I don't know what his, you know, how you would see it spiritually, but the questions are the right questions. And I want to throw these out to you because I think that these fit so well uh, exactly what Jesus would say. You need to ask yourself these questions. If you're a parent, you need to ask your kids these questions. You need to help them to learn the answers to these questions. Here they are. The three questions are this. Um, who tells you who, who you are? Who tells us who we are? That's what he asks. You know, he wants to teach them. Because that, that has so much to do with what you're going to look for for answers. How you see yourself, how you understand yourself. Mary understood herself, so did Martha. But Mary, you know, in in the most realistic way, saw herself as attached to who Jesus was. This this is the one who knows the Creator. This is the one who made me. This one who understands me. Uh, The second question is absolutely follows in line with that. So where do you want to go with your life? And 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 and. Mary would say, it's being around him that I really know where I want to go with my life, what I was made for. And then the third question, which absolutely fits, is well, then how are you going to get there? And, and those are the basic questions of life, but they are absolutely attached to something. You know? So I don't know where Michael Mulligan would attach them, but I think they're great questions. They're insightful. They really are the questions that you, you can find an answer for in your relationship with God, in your relationship, not just God, with Jesus Christ, because he sent Jesus Christ so that you would have a relationship with God. He sends his Holy Spirit, Christ, in us so that you will have a relationship with God. You find that relationship and you find the answers that, that you're looking for. And it, and it is so needed. In his article, he quotes uh, from two other books. In fact, I, I want to read uh, just qu- uh, a couple of quick if I don't stab myself my glasses, quotes for you uh, out of his uh, article. The first one he quotes from a, um, a guy, a former Yale professor named William uh, Dershowitz, who uh, wrote a book called Excellent Sheep, uh, The Miseducation of the American Elite and the Way to a Meaningful Life. And this is what he writes in his book. He says, a large-scale survey found self-reports of emotional well-being have fallen to the lowest levels in, 25, in a 25-year study. 50% of college students report feelings of hopelessness. One-third report feeling uh, so depressed that it is difficult to function in the last 12 months. Uh, They are stressed out, overpressured. They exhibit uh, toxic levels of fear, anxiety, depression, emptiness, aimlessness, and isolation. Pretty disturbing, isn't it? He's dealing with the elite. He's dealing with Yale, Harvard, that's what he's dealing with. And then then he also quotes a book by Madeline Levine uh, called The Price of Privilege, Uh, how uh, parental pressure and material advantage are creating a generation of disconnected and unhappy kids. 
Listen from her book, what she says. Preteens from affluent, well-educated families experience among the highest rates of depression, substance abuse, anxiety disorders, somatic complaints, and unhappiness of any group of children in our country. As many as 22% of adolescent girls from financially comfortable families suffer from clinical depression. You're like, well, thank you for that good news. Right? Yeah. <laughs> You know what they're saying? What happens is we, we lose our way with all the details. Because in that group, among those kids, it is absolutely about getting all the things done. And they miss the most important things. Now, I'm not telling you that these authors know what the answer is, because if you read their stuff, I think that they still miss the most important thing. I think they're, they're way off in that. But they recognize this. That, that all of the details and all the success and all the achievement that we go for and we strive with our kids don't really work. In fact, in one of the, in, in, in one of the books, um, uh, one of the authors talks about this. They said, here's the problem with the, the higher education thing is that, that everything is about getting into the right college. And they even cite the fact that when you know, you're told, you know, be on a team, that the whole point of being on a team is not learning uh, uh, sports, the, the teamwork of sports, building character, learning, not all those things that you learn from it that are great experiences that you should learn from it. The whole point in, in, a, in American culture with higher education is it'll look on your resume and get you into one of the schools. We miss it. <laughs> we miss it. Because we're after the award, the achievement, the next thing, we think that will do it, and that does not do it because that is just like sand. It's just the small stuff. It just passes. It doesn't matter. It will not last. It will not sustain you. It will not get you where you are looking to go and where you want to go. Who tells you who you are? Where do you want to go with your life? You can't answer that first one. You're going to have a hard time getting the second one right, right? Yeah. And how are you going to get there? And this is exactly, when you talk about simplifying your life, getting your life in order, this is the question you have to answer because you can go after all the details, all the details, get all the details right, and they're just like, you know, the small stuff, the sand that just passes through your life and it still won't bring what you're really looking for. So, you know, what I'm, what I'm proposing and, and pushing for and cheering on for, not just for you but for me also, is let's get the, the most important stuff right. Let's go back to what really matters. And let me tell you, you get no awards for that part. Not now. <laughs> but boy, life is totally different when you get, you get that part, the big stuff, uh, right. And you've decided that's a priority. And I'm going to focus on that. And then the small things that do fall to the side because you can't get them done, you're okay with because you've got the big stuff done. You're not looking for all the little details to make the big stuff right. You realize, no, it's the big stuff that, that makes the other part fit or find its place. Three steps real quick to a, uh, a simpler uh, or a more simple and a more powerful life. Here they are. Three steps real quick. There they go. Number one is, um, number one, there it is, show up. Uh, you could, because you have to make yourself available if you want to change. One of the things that they found in these studies is millennials, and millennials are in the high school now, they're the last of the millennials. Millennials are very, very, very well-educated, come from prosperous families for the most part in this country, but they're very open to change. And the reason is because they're still looking for something, that, something that really matters. But you have got to show up in the right place. If you don't show up chasing the right things, making yourself available for the right change, you're, you're not going to have the right change. And so, you, you know, you're not, it, it, God's not going to chase you around. I'm not going to say, you just do whatever you want to, I'll, you know, it doesn't work that way. You, you have to make some priorities in your life. You have to set some priorities. Second thing is, you, you need to build into your life uh, a, a, a time to spend with Jesus himself. I mean, that, that's how you grow. That's how you learn. That, that's how, you know, these who are around him, that's how they went and they spent time with him because he, he put things in place. He, he made them feel so much more confident and so much better about their life because they understood what mattered and what would last. And I'm not just talking about picking up the Bible and reading a verse to read a verse or picking up a devotional book to read. You, know, you want to say, I want to know you. I want to learn from you. You, you came for that purpose. I, I want that time, and that makes it. Now, let me tell you what it does is it also means, just like if you're a Martha, that means he's going to say at times, hey, it brings some accountability in your life that you need, that I need, so that if I'm off track, if I'm chasing the wrong things, if I'm not doing the right things, listen, he's going to say, 
you know, he's going to lead. He's going to direct. That's what you want in life, don't you? Sure you do. I want it also. I don't want to just chase what I desire. You know what happens with the secular world? The secular world thinks this, and we have fallen into that. The secular world says this, the highest good and the highest that you can achieve is to follow your own desires, follow your own heart. That is bogus. If you follow your own desires and your own, you will not end up in a good place. You will end up in a deep hole in life. It is not wise. To, but the reason the secular world says that is because they don't believe there's a God. So the, the desires of you as a person have to be the highest goal and the highest good. They're, they're trapped in that philosophy. They have no choice because they don't believe there is a God that is loving, that cares, that wants better for you, that will call you out at times and set you straight because he has a path for you that is the very best path possible for you. What God says is good, what is good is your best good also. But that doesn't mean it's always what you want doesn't mean it's always what your heart would chase after. You know, you want someone just like my daughter knows, call dad, because even as I'm struggling with what my heart would chase after, dad loves me. And dad will tell me, you know, the truth, you know, and, and help lead me and guide me and direct me. He'll say, you need to look at this. and th You know, absolutely. You want someone like that, don't you? Sure you do. I want someone that loves me so much that is so much wiser than them, so much smarter than them, that they won't always give me what I want. <laughs> because when they know, I know it's what you want, but it's not good. That, that, yeah, of course you do. And that's what that time is all about. It's not just going to, to God. It's, your prayer time is not about saying, okay, I, I don't like my dress. I need a new car. My toe hurts. That's not, you know, it's about knowing him, spending time with him. And man, he talks to you a lot of things. And what happens is when you spend time with God, it really becomes like, but God, what do you think is important, huh? You know, God, you know, man, that changes everything. What a, what a great way to live. Third thing is this. <clears throat> Get involved in a small group. We're, we're starting some new small groups. We call it, we're calling them simplify groups. Um, I just call them simple groups. And uh, you need a small group because just like we need a relationship with God, you also need a relationship with other people who are striving together, pushing toward the same thing. That's part of showing up. So you say, you know, I can, I can build these relationships, and I can encourage someone else, and, and they can encourage me. This is what it, the writer of Hebrews, this is how the writer of Hebrews puts it. He says, we must also consider how to encourage each other to show love and to do good things. We, we do. We should not stop gathering together with other believers, as some of you are doing. Instead, we must continue to encourage each other, even more as we see the day of the Lord coming. You know what that means? That means the time is limited. You can't say, I will just put this off. The time is now. You take advantage of the opportunity now to build that in your life. You know why? Because it will build results. It will produce something in your future. There's an old saying when I was young that an old minister used to say, he, he would always do this. He would say, tomorrow you will become more of what you have decided to do today. And he was absolutely right. What you have put yourself into today, what you've decided to work on and to build in your life today, tomorrow you will become more and more of that. So today is your choice. Today is your opportunity. Make a change. Show up. Find, you know, the strength, the big stuff that you're really looking for. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, just thank you that you know what we really need because you understand us. You made us. And um, Lord, you know how prone we are to chase after all the details, all the things that don't really matter, thinking somehow if we get all those right, all those right, that the big stuff will take care of itself. But Lord, we are, we are thankful that we have someone who loves us, who tells us the truth, and who cares enough to, to lead us to the big things, the most important things, the things that really matter. This morning as we pray together, I wonder if you would pray something like this. Lord, I want to know you in a real way. I want to sit at your feet. I want to listen to your words. I want you to guide me. So this would be a real relationship. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.